Okay. Um, there's a lot of slides in this deck. Some of them I'm just going to go through, the, um, take pictures. You're going to get the decks, obviously, after the, uh, uh, the presentations are done. They're good reference material. This is a great reference material. If you're dealing with security at all, it came out from U.S. Homeland Security. There's a link on the bottom here. It's about a 120-page document, but interestingly enough, it's focused on protecting enterprise. So if you're looking to create mobile security guidelines, you're working with customers, you want to know what best practices are, April 2017, very recent. Uh, there's some older documents, I'll go through those as well, that are really good. And it's interesting to look, they, they published this little block diagram, obviously 120 pages, I wasn't going to put it up here, mobile security threats by threat category. And what do they call, they call mobile tech, device technology stack, and they define that, and you can see it up in the right-hand corner. It, it's everything about the hardware, the firmware, the operating system, the applications. And the point of that is, is to show how complex and how, how many different components actually impact the overall security profile of the device. Some interesting ones here. I don't know if anybody remembers Zombie Zero. Remember Zombie Zero? That was a few years back where this was, it was actually, uh, it, it was a scanning stack that was, um, trying to remember what OS it was, but it, it was a scanning stack that came from China uh, and supposedly reported that it was actually a state sanctioned attack. And what it was doing was it was specifically designed for monitoring shipments through TNL to see what was going out to robotics manufacturers. So that's specifically what they're trying to find out, what parts were actually going to robotics manufacturers. So I, presumption being is that they were going to try to reverse some, engineer some of that. But it, it shows you the nature of the complexity of security. But look at the top one there, delays in security updates as one of the key mobile security threats by category. Exactly the topic we're going to talk about right now. Some great quotes. I always love quotes, and especially when you can pull them out of a document like that. The most important defense against mobile device security threat is to ensure devices are patched against the public, publicly known uh, security vulnerabilities. That's exactly what this topic of LifeGuard is going to be about. When making procurement decisions, enterprises should seek clear commitment from device vendors or mobile carriers that security updates will be provided in a timely manner. So we're going to talk about, when we talk about li LifeGuard, what it's really about is making sure that customers get periodic, predictable, and aggressive security updates, exactly to that point. And when a device model is no longer supported with updates, enterprises should decommission those devices. So any idea what the security lifecycle model is for, let's say, uh, not to pick on Google, Google's here, uh, but a Pixel device. I mean, Google typically is the gold standard. It's 36 months. That's from the first product ship. And by the way, that is typical for consumer devices. So if you're looking at 36 months from the first product ship, let's assume there's an enterprise, and maybe they're not going to buy the device on the first day it's released. Maybe they buy it 6 or 12 months in. So that takes 6 or 12 months out of the cycle. Then they spend another 3 months looking for different bidders. Then they spend another 3 months going through a pilot program. By the time they get through with all that, they're 18 months into the product cycle and they've only got 18 months before they've got to rip and replace it because they can't get security support. This is a major problem. So security lifecycle, and we've heard this from customers uh, more so of recent, uh, I'd say in the last 6, 12 months, almost every tier 1 customer I taught, the day you stop security lifecycle is the day we're pulling the devices out of service. You, know, you get fired for not having security support. Wow, a question. I haven't heard any interactive questions. So my question is, Okay, well, Google doesn't, I mean, by the way, Google's doing the right thing. And most consumer devices, I think, are doing the right thing. You think about what is the job of a consumer device. It's to provide very leading edge technology on a very rapid cadence and a very rapid churn rate. Device manufacturers are Samsung. I don't know if Samsung's here, but um, Samsung doesn't want to extend the life of devices. They want to shorten the life. They would very much like to have you buy a device every year, maybe every two years. What we're trying to do here is to say that we're going to allow customers to keep the devices in service five or six or seven years. I'm going to go through the details. But you know that's what our customer base wants, which is very different from what uh, consumer device manufacturers want. So they're trying to shorten it. We're actually going to elongate it. We're going to go through some of the details there. 
Okay, so who needs updates? So if I were a really, really good technical marketing person, what would I do? I would introduce a virus that shows why you need to do an update. Now, you guys probably know where I'm going. If you've lived in a hole, remember WannaCry. You know, it wasn't that long ago, a month, month and a half ago. So WannaCry was ransomware. Um, the interesting factoid, now, WannaCry worked in several different ways, but it started by basically having uh, malicious content in an email or a PDF file, but then it spread using a worm, and it spread using uh, SMBs, basically uh, service message blocks. And the reality is it was remote code execution, but that's the way it spread. And guess what? If you go back and you look at March of 2017, Microsoft, what did they do? They had a patch for the SMB. So this was a known vulnerability. So the guys that got hacked didn't update. And that's exactly what I'm here talking about. So, so this was a perfect segue. And I always, I don't have any giveaways, unfortunately. How much do you think was paid in ransomware in 2016? US dollars. $1 billion. So people paid $1 billion in ransomware. So ransomware is a pretty good business, you know. I'm not telling you to go out and start. <laughs> hey, Bruce said we should go make the wanna work, wanna cry too. But the reality is it's an attractive business. Uh, and you know, so $1 billion, uh, not a bad thing. Um, so you've got to be able to expect this. But in this case, in this instance, it was mostly preventable by just loading that March 2017 patch. Uh, this is another document, eye chart, uh, lots of good things. Uh, the two documents that I'm gonna tell you, kind of your homework, if you really look interested in security best practices, this is an older document, it's 2013, it's from NIST, National Institute of Science Technology. Um, but you'll see some of the one things that I highlighted in the top, and it really comes down to, once again, best practice is maintenance. Get those security updates as much as possible. Okay, um, I always like to do some analyst data just to show you that this isn't something that we're only seeing. This is from VDC. VDC probably looks at our market more, than, more closely than any other analyst that's out there. So they did a, uh, a survey of users, uh, specifically for rugged handheld devices, mobile OS selection criteria, number one, security, 55.1%. On the other side, you look at the challenges that are encountered through mobile, uh, what's the, when managing and supporting a mobile workforce. Guess what, number one was security. So A is it's top of mind, and B is it's a massive problem. So what a great opportunity, right? You look at even in the warehouse, and this one actually surprised me, because I always, I talk to a lot of customers doing warehouse, and they're like, well, we're a warehouse, we're a closed environment, we're not as, necessarily conscious of security. Uh, the folks these uh, talked to actually had security features, you know, mobile device selection criteria for warehouse applications, security features 49.1%. So once again, even in the warehouse. And this is where I usually get into that discussion where I get into this fallacy, right? Well, I'm running terminal emulation. I'm really not storing anything on the device. And then I say, well, what about dress code? And they're like, what do you mean? I'm dressed okay, right? No, it's not about dress. Dress code was an attack last year, in the middle of last year. And what it was, basically, it loaded a, a, a SOX uh, proxy onto the device, and basically it used the device to get into your backend servers. Now, all of a sudden, it's like, oh, okay, yeah, I'm not storing a lot on the device, but nonetheless, the device as a gateway to your backend servers, that scares the heck out of everybody, right? And of course, no matter what you're gonna do on that communications link, you've compromised the device, even if it was a VPN going back, you're still gonna get through that. So, pretty potent stuff and pretty scary. So, only the paranoid survive. I'm a big believer, oh, and maybe it's part of my job to be paranoid. So, we're gonna talk a little bit about common vulnerability exposure, CVEs. That's the way vulnerabilities are reported. So you'll hear me use the term CVEs, common vulnerability exposures, and guess what? There's a CVSS, you can probably guess by the numbers and the, the, the color codes there, Common Vulnerability Scoring System. And as you can see, it's low, moderate, high, and critical. Uh, you look at some of the things under critical. Remote arbitrary code execution in a privileged process. 
that's pretty severe stuff. Or you look at the other one I highlighted there, unauthorized access to data secured by the TE. But by the definition, the TE should be completely, it's a hardware security environment that should be very, very secure. So that, this is serious stuff, and that's what I'm trying to bring out here. When you look at something and you say it's critical, you should absolutely take, take heed to that. Uh, there is actually an online tool where if you have a vulnerability that you're kind of Hey, let me see what it's going to rank here. You can actually go through and it'll give you a quantitative number and you'll be able to figure out whether it's low, moderate, high, or critical. Okay, Android vulnerabilities. So let's talk a little bit about Android vulnerability trends. Uh, and just to be clear, vulnerability is not an attack, is not a threat. I kind of like to look at vulnerabilities as kind of like an adjective and a, an attack being a verb and a threat being an entity more of a noun. So I always think vulnerability doesn't mean it actually has been attacked. And that's been some of the, the hype around some of the Android vulnerabilities. And the reality, as Google will tell you many times, is in the wild we never see those things. But you always see the headlines, right? One billion Android devices are vulnerable. Um, so there's lots of different databases that track vulnerabilities. Uh, this happens to be one, once again, the details on the bottom. And a little bit of an eye chart, but I took a period from January to f April in 2016 and compared it to 2017 just to get a little visibility into what's happening in the trending. So the big red dot, red, the diameter represents the number of vulnerabilities as a percentage or the critical vulnerabilities. And the smaller red dot, this is good, right? We've gone from that same period, big red dot to a small red dot. But th what this is is a percentage of the overall vulnerabilities that were ranked as critical. So on a percentage basis, you know, the good news is as an ecosystem, we're doing much better on a percentage basis. The kind of the bad news, or maybe good news, depends how you look at it, is the number, absolute number of vulnerabilities are going up. Now, it could be that we're doing a better job scrutinizing those vulnerabilities, or it could be that more folks are looking, you know, as you're going to go off and create WannaCry 2 now, uh, you know, are looking to hack these devices. So good news, bad news here. Um, Google does publish, and it's a great report. Uh, every year they do a Android security whatever year in review. So this is a couple of the, the points that came out of this, this year's, so this year for last year. So Google did address 655 vulnerabilities, which is good or bad, a year over year increase of 275%. So they're getting much more aggressive on these vulnerabilities. Interesting, average, it was about 11 critical vulnerabilities per month. So we talked about how critical really means critical. This isn't something where you're seeing one or two a year. You're seeing quite a few every month. So you really need to be aggressive here. Uh, this is very important. So all the, our Android devices go through what's called a compatibility test suite, CTS. And it's a test procedure that's published by Google. Uh, the test procedures today, when we do a release and we go through our CTS certification, it actually now checks to see that the security updates are relatively fresh uh, within 60 days. So we can't even release now new software without making sure that we have the patches up to a certain date. So that's a, that's a great governance, if you will, to make sure that things are actually moving forward. Okay, I'm going to go through this very quickly because, but I do want to make sure you understand the difference between what we consider Cabo, corporately owned business only, and COPE and BYOD. So we break devices in the world to individual liable devices and corporate liable devices. Individual, you went and bought them. Corporate, corporation bought them. We then take those divisions and individual liable devices, we categorize them as personal only. You're going to use it for your personal purposes or BYOD. It's both your personal and corporate device. Corporate liable devices, COPE, corporately owned, personally enabled. Okay, still got that dual persona, right? There's a work profile and there's your personal profile. The only difference is the corporation bought it and issued it to you. COPE, the corporation bought it and you're using it for business only. So that's the distinction. And we'll equate that, and you probably heard it in some of the other presentations, like device owner mode. That's device owner mode in the newer vernacular of Android. Uh, the key here is to understand, first of all, Cabo is about 5 million units a year addressable market. That's it. We're very small compared to some of those others. You can see personal only is 960 million devices a year. So there's about 
billion units a year. So we are very, very small. So the only way, and in the past we had Windows Mobile CE, but, and I was trying to go after that market, but that market is way too small to be able to amortize all the development costs. So we had to leverage an operating system that was really, truly successful across the board. Android was obvious choice. Uh, you think about the devices that fold into each one of those different segments. Of course, our device is very much focused on verticals. This is the life cycles. So I don't have, I couldn't find good worldwide data. I can tell you in the US, the refresh rates right now for smartphones is going up. You know, the old, well, the new hardware is not that compelling anymore. So it's about 29 months right now, 29 or 30 months in the US. That's up from, you, know, you can see the curve here, about 24 months not long ago. So people are keeping devices. That's a consumer. Now, by the way, consumer manufacturers, they don't like to see that. They want the curve to go the other way, of course. They want to keep the churn rate going. For us, our surveys are showing that 51%, and this is actually about a year and a half old. I'm getting a refresh uh, as we speak. I'm sure it's going to be much higher. 51% of the customers we survey are saying they want to keep the device in service five years or longer. And I can tell you the customers that I talk to, I usually get the, well, our policy is four to five years, but I know what's going to happen. We'll never throw them out. If they're still working, we're going to keep using them and using them and using them seven, eight, nine years. You go to a Walmart, we've got products in there that are 15, 20 years old. So that's the reality. Uh, just recognize that Cabo is different. Um, you know, the desired life cycle is much longer than what you would expect on those other devices. Um, from an EMM perspective, recognize that this really is looking at a lockdown. And we're going to talk more about what lockdown means. There was another session on it, but I'm going to talk about it from a security perspective. And uh, it, the risk profile is high. You know, this has got mission critical data on these devices. OK, this is going to be a real quick one. I just wanted to give you some perspective of a typical consumer lifecycle model. So this is actually it is based on Nexus, and Pixel is adopting the, the Nexus model. Basically, there's two years of over-the-air support, over-the-air updates. So when we talk about, I get the question a lot, how many operating systems are you going to support on a device? Typically, the Qualcomm's of the world is what we call release plus two. They do one release on a dessert, and then they do two subsequent releases. So we call it release plus two. And by the way, for Google, and uh, in this case, Pixel, there's two years of updates. But the security model is slightly different. The security model is you get a minimum of 36 months or you get 18 months past the end of sale of the device. Okay? I just happened, I picked the Nexus 6 just because I had lots of data on it. Turns out that was available for sale for 13 months. Well, you add 13 plus 18, you come out to 31. That's less than 36, so you got 36 months. So when you're looking at a, when you're talking to customers, you're working with customers, you are an end customer, and you're considering a consumer device, you've got to consider where in this cycle you're buying it, and then how much more do you have for security support? Because you know the day you got them in service and you're past this date is the day that your IT administrator is likely to get fired. Okay, uh, so let's talk a little bit more about Cabo, and you know I, I love quotes. Uh, you know there are lies, damn lies, and statistics. I can probably make any case for anything you want by pulling some kind of statistic out. So what I did is I did a survey among our, our, our sales engineers, and I asked them, of our devices, of the customers that you talk to, what percentage of your customers are using some form of application whitelisting, or they're actually using a custom launcher, enterprise home screen, that actually is locking down the UI. So basically having locked down applications. It turns out, you can almost ignore field service. We only had four participants that qualified in the field service. But retail and healthcare, a look at manufacturing warehouse, over 80% of both of those are using some kind of application whitelisting. So when we talk about doing a risk assessment, you know, the two things you look at is what's the impact of that data getting compromised, and then what's the probability that it's going to get compromised. If, in fact, those devices, you've already created your first you know, there is some, uh, you know, multi-level defense, a defense in depth. You've already created your first layer in that defense in depth strategy just by doing those lockdowns. Restricting or blocking internet access. Now, 
We did this, I didn't like the way we did it, actually somebody modified mine, but on AOSP versus GMS devices, but you can see that 77 or 80 percent, 77 to 83 percent of the devices actually have restricted internet access. That means they're either going through a firewall or they have no internet access at all. Once again, we look at malicious websites, guess what? You've already created another layer in your defense in depth. So this is for Cabo. Cabo is different than lots of the other scenarios of COPE and BYOD. Um, even if you look at our shipments, just bare shipments, 75% of our shipments last year were wireless LAN only. So we look at MMS attacks, things like stage fright, lots of different ways to execute stage fright, but one of them was through MMS. Guess what? These don't, devices didn't even have MMS on it. So as much as you, know, you want to make sure you protect the core, there are lots of things, especially in our market, that are typically taken advantage of to lock down the device and to control that periphery. Another interesting stat here was the fact that most of the customers that are viewed by the SEs still are not really in tune with the need for security patches. Now this was done before WannaCry, so it'll be interesting to go back and do the same survey. I'll bet you it's probably a, a lot higher right now. Um, okay, fun statistics. <laughs> I, I've recognized that there's, there's definitely beer centricity uh, uh, here. So this is to Joe's point about, uh, I had to go back and uh, Joe mentioned that it was about 142 liters per, uh, uh, per capita in the Czech Republic. So I figured that's about 1.2 bottles per day. Now, of course, that's for every man, woman, and child. Um, the U.S., I'm ashamed to say, we're at 6.6 6 bottles per day, you know. And, but I am happy to say that I'm trying to pull up the U.S. <laughs> <laughs> However, I realize that the, the five-year-old is, I'm only drinking three times the amount of the five-year-old in the Czech Republic, so I, I still don't think this is that, that great. So anyway, so 3.6, I'll see if I can bump that up later tonight, but I'm still better than the U.S. average. Um, Google does provide, a, I hope you attended some of the GMS sessions um, with Andy and uh, probably Chuck and you know, there are some very strong things in, uh, in the Google security support. They are cloud based so you know this is one of the issues if in fact you're behind that firewall and you're not allowing these devices to get to, to the Google cloud, you know, these are somewhat muted. Okay, let's talk a little bit, let's, I wanna get into the, uh, the Android, uh, the uh, lifeguard. This is kind of our high level model for security. Three basic bubbles, defense in depth, right? Defense in depth, multi-level security. Uh, you know, I'm an old security guy, I love the way we can spin things and make it sound really impressive. Principle of least privilege. Shut down everything and everything you're not using. It's, it, it's kind of obvious, right? It reduces your attack surface. If you're not using, this is that whole periphery. If you're not using it, shut it down. What we use is in that funny little icon, that's our Motorola, ex Motorola <laughs> mobile extensions. Uh, Freudian still can't kick that. Um, so that's our, our MX, and that's really about providing defense in depth and principle of least privilege. What we're introducing, what we introduced two months ago, and I'm talking about today, is really what's called lifeguard, and that's really about the third bubble, which is security lifecycle management. So those two are focused on mitigation, right? Controlling that periphery. This is really focused on remediation. How do we actually take that core and solve the fundamental vulnerabilities that are there? And those two, to really have a comprehensive strategy, you gotta have the two working together. Okay. Um, Let's quickly go through this. Um, I get a lot of questions from customers about, like, tell me how to navigate this whole security thing. It really just seems so fuzzy in my head. There is a Google security blog. If you really want to go to sleep, I probably should have went to the blog last night. Um, you know, if you're a security guy, this is, this is good stuff. You start there. Every month, Google releases a security bulletin. So you'll see January, February, March, and all the URLs in here. In each one of those monthly bulletins, you're gonna see a list of CVEs. You now know what CVEs are. And you're gonna see the CVEs, and there's a short abstract, a few, few words, and then there's a severity level of the CVE. So one, you can go to the blog. Two is you look at the monthly bulletins. Once you've got those monthly bulletins, you're gonna say critical and high. What does that really mean? Okay, there is a site that will describe in more detail than you'll ever want to know of what constitutes those different levels. 
But then you're going to sit there and say, well, yeah, I got a CVE number. I got four words that describe it. I can't go to my senior execs and tell them, you know, th it's this. Go into the MITRE database and you put that CVE number in, you'll get more information once again about that vulnerability that you ever want to know. So this is kind of the Google in a very, very high level. And then you say, well, how does that relate to device portfolio? What you do is then you look at the devices you have in your portfolio. You then go into a Zebra portal and you'll see a list of patches that are available for that specific device. In the description, what you'll see is typically a reference in the patch in the release notes to the security patch level. That security patch level is that monthly bulletin for Google. So what you'll do is once you see that, you'll download that, you'll put it onto the device, you can either sideload it or you can do it over the air with an EMM, and then at the end of the day, you'll go back and look on the device and make sure that it's up to that security patch level. So that's the Google side, and then this is how it manifests itself to get it onto the actual devices. Okay? Do you have any notification service? Do I have what? Any notifications, any? Uh, it's coming up. Um, <laughs> I'm embarrassed to say. Is it customer? Well, yeah. So what happened is we just changed our back end infrastructure. Amazingly enough, acquisitions of large companies are always amazing how long. We have just changed off the Motorola infrastructure. And now we're onto the zebra. In doing so, it's amazing, but IT actually, we somehow lost our notification services. So that is coming back online next week. And, well, that's the good news. I'll tell you the bad news. Uh, remember, I'm not a sales guy, so the sales guys always cringe when I always say that. Uh, is that uh, right now, it's not selective. So in the first release next week, you, what you'll do is you'll sign up, but you'll get notified on every security patch for every device. A uh, couple of weeks later, what you're going to find is you'll be able to select your devices and whatever you have under management, you'll be able to. And we'll talk about even further than that. Then what we're going to do is we're going to move it where the EMMs can do that for you with a machine-to-machine -machine interface, a, a RESTful web service that we'll be providing them. And then what we're going to do beyond that is we'll move into an analytics. Okay, so uh, I'll go through a little bit of roadmap for, for a lifeguard. But great question. No, another question? What was that answer? Yeah, so I, I guess LifeGuard is, is certainly unparalleled compared to the rest of the enterprise, like rugged space. Mm, it it better be a lot better, space. otherwise I'm not going to be well, here next in year. In terms of uh, the consumer competition, uh, where you might be able to get access to those Google updates immediately when they're released, you know, how, how do we come back? We're typically, we're, we're, no, so we are, our goal, and by the way, if you read Samsung, and I've read them all, Nobody commits. Nobody says, we are going to guarantee we'll be X days. And one of the reasons, and there's a, if we get to it, there's a slide that shows how all this manifest, how this works throughout the chain. There are a lot of dependents, Qualcomm, for example. You look at a lot of the vulnerabilities, they're actually at the SOC level. MediaTek, Qualcomm, and you know, we can't dictate how fast Qualcomm's going to move. So there are a lot of players involved here. So it's difficult for anybody, Samsung, Zebra, anybody, to actually provide definitive, and Samsung's words, and by the way, it's similar to our words, which is, you know, it may vary by product and region. We aspire, like everybody, to be on that date of the security bulletin. Do we always hit it? We're coming down and down. I think we're averaging about three to five days right now. So. We're getting better, but we absolutely want to be on the day of the bulletin. Uh, but make no mistake, the length, the duration of the security support compared to the consumer devices, there's no comparison. And we'll, I'll get to it, but we're going to do, we're doing two years beyond end of sale of the product. So if you know our products, we typically call our products like 334455. The first number represents the years of sale. The second number represents the hardier years of service. So a 55 product would be, Five years available for sale, five years available for hardware service. Under LifeGuard, those products will get two years beyond the sale date. So on a 5.5 product, you'd get seven years of security support. Compare that to the 36 months. So no, we think we're, the, the length is much longer. The aggressiveness, uh, the consumer guys, especially the top tier, are pretty good. OK. Um, so perfect, actually, segue. How does this whole thing work? And it's actually amazing. This is a testimonial to 
Android should not work, but it does work amazingly well. You think about what, so you start off Android, there's a security team, there's an entire community behind it, there's research, there's the uh, network vulnerability, uh, national vulnerability database, you've got the governments involved. This is great. So there's an Android engineering team that has to take all that input, and then by the way, there's a bunch of upstream components. They gotta take that vulnerability information, they gotta look at the upstream components, and then by the way, they gotta work with all the silicon vendors, what we were just talking about. They've gotta take that, bring it all together, and what they do is they put out a set of generic patches. Okay, this is great. I say generic because then every vendor has to go and put those patches into their builds. So we then take that, we and everybody else, all the device OEMs, we integrate it, we debug, engineering test, we go through the CTS and GTS, which is the compatibility test suite and, and the GMS testing. We then actually have to get it certified, make sure everything is truly the way it should be. We then go through a release process and we may or may not have to go through carrier approval. By the way, we do that for every device. We do have to do that for all the different operating systems that we're shipping on those devices. And by the way, we've also got to consider if we've integrated other third-party applications into this whole model. Finally, at the end of this, there is the Google security button, bulletin, right? And we aspire to have our patches as close to that bulletin as possible. Every 30 days this happens. And just to make things amazing, is it happens across 200 manufacturers, 24,000 devices, 351 carriers, and 190 countries, right? Now, not every vendor actually does this. In a perfect world, every vendor should do this. There are very few that do. And you could imagine how you know our portfolio. I didn't put all the roadmap slides. We have a very, very extensive portfolio of Android, um, some of them shipping on multiple operating system releases. This is very, very challenging, which is why so few people, so few people do it. Um, so let's talk about LifeGuard, and then we should be just about out of time. I talked about this. This is typically what our hardware model is. What we're doing on LifeGuard is three slash four things. One is we're extending the security life, and we're going to two years beyond end of sale. We just talked about that, right? So a 5.5 product would get seven years, 4.4 four would get six years, three, year, three would get five years. So that's number one. Number two is what happens when an enterprise transitions? You know, there isn't an enterprise that I've talked to that sits there and says, when we get a new operating system, what we do is we just throw it out to all 10,000 devices and we hope everything works. Yeah, right. So there has to be a transition period. Now, most companies, there isn't a transition period. In fact, I don't know of any company that does it. Um, what we're doing is we're providing what we call an OS transition period. So we'll continue to support the older OS, even though there's a newer OS release, for 12 months. So this way it gives the, the enterprise an opportunity, that 12 month window to say, I'm still supported with security for 12 months, allowing me to transition to the newer operating system. That's a huge benefit. Three is aggressive predictable updates. Now depending on the life cycle, 15 minutes, thank you. Uh, monthly or quarterly, uh, it'll be monthly or quarterly. Monthly and during when it's the current latest operating system. I'm not going to have time to go through all the details, but there are periods when in the latter stages it'll move out to quarterly. Those are the three pillars of LifeGuard. Extending the model, support, really logistics, support while tra customers transition, and then the aggressive predictable updates. So this is the, the, the key element here. Now, all of those are for free. <clears throat> And by the way, partners like yourselves, most of you, uh, you'll be able to sell something, don't worry, other than this benefit, this is a huge benefit. All of these come for free if a customer is under Zebra One Care and they have software support. The only time that there is an additional fee to a customer uh, is if they want to extend any of these. So amazingly enough, as long as this is, and we've already had customers already tell us Yes, we're gonna go beyond, <laughs> and it was a five-year product. So seven years you would think is enough. We had one customer in Australia said, we need to go two years beyond that. We need to go nine years. So we, they already made us commit to providing the extended support model. So you can buy one-year extensions for either extending the overall security life or extending the OS transition period. And we've already had customers, and even though this is just brand new, who said, okay, we definitely need to have that. So the, the OS transition period, right? Let's say customers on Marshmallow. 
we release Nougat. Okay, Mr. Customer, Nougat's the latest operating system. You got 12 months of security support on Marshmallow. Hopefully during that 12 months, you're migrating. Customer's like, ah, oh, you know what? I thought I'd be able to do it. I can't get over in time. You can, they can buy a one-year extension, okay? And it's in the neighborhood, uh, I think the list price is about 215,000 US dollars, which for a major enterprise, if they're gonna have, to, if they can keep their devices in service for another year, that's still, I've talked to a lot of customers, a lot of partners, and everybody still thinks that's a, that's a very reasonable price considering the benefits that they get. Okay, uh, common lifeguard questions. I'm gonna go through this real quick. Is it the same as MX? No. MX <coughs> is really about the extensions. It's not about the life cycle model, which is what lifeguard's about. Uh, is Zebra providing security updates after Google has ended security support? Absolutely. That's what this is all about. And is that really hard? Yeah, Emma, what, during Google support window, you know, it's still hard, as you saw in that little chart before, but it's doable. This is really hard, and we've got an entire staff. It's probably about 25 people now just doing this full time that just sit there and work on security updates. Um, we already talked about how they're installed. You can either sideload them, you can go over the air. Uh, talked a little bit about that. Yeah, we hit those. Okay, I do get often asked about hey, what, is, what do you see as kind of like best practice? And it's impossible to do one slide best practice, but you know, in short, customer, what do you do? You have to take an inventory, you have to understand your profile management for each of your organizational units, right? Because each OU may have different data that's more or less critical, different levels of impact, and they may have different policies provision. Some may be whitelisted, some may not be whitelisted. Some may have a completely shut down device. Um, this is the key. The key is that customers now, and potentially with your support and service, um, monthly risk profile analysis. In which case, you've got to now go through all those vulnerabilities, right? And there's typically about 35 a month that come out. Got to go through every one of those vulnerabilities. You've got to do a risk profile analysis against all the different organizational units, the different policy configurations that are there, the different vulnerability, the data that they're storing. Um, the impact of to business, you know, is it going to disrupt my business? Am I going to lose productivity? Am I going to damage my reputation? You know, some of these things are very, very significant. You know, you've got to look at these mitigation policies. You've got to see whether these CVEs are even relevant. You know, if it's a media tech vulnerability and it's a Qualcomm architecture, they may not even be relevant. Finally, then you go into the patch and discovery phase. Okay, I got to find the patches. Once I identify what patches I need to install, I go look for them, and then I go through my process for getting these tested, validated, make sure it didn't break anything. Sometimes, you know, we've all lived that. Sometimes the, uh, the cure can be worse than the disease. I mean, we've all sit there and cringed when you ask for the update, and you say, yes, please don't break anything. Please don't break anything. Uh, yeah, let me know how that works. Uh, okay, so this is kind of the, the where LifeGuard's going. You know, Q317 is just about getting all our infrastructure, getting as quickly as possible to those security dates uh, at the bulletin. Uh, we just talked about having either a RSS notification, just resurrecting that, as embarrassing as that is. And then what we'll do is to be announced, I can't give you all the details, there will be a RESTful web service, so we'll provide a machine-to-machine -machine interface so an EMM can then actually obtain the information about the vulnerabilities and provide IT administrators policies for how to best provision those. After that comes the security analytics. So that'll allow you, so basically it's make it work, make it easy, make it smart. Seems pretty logical, right? Okay, so conclusion, um, you know, security life cycle, it's time to stop, you know, sort of those 32, 33% that customers that, yeah, we really care about it. It's time to stop that. It's time to really become more vigilant, more proactive. Uh, it's time to institutionalize a lot of your policies for patch management. Um, always consider mitigation or remediation. Right? And that's one of the things that by doing both MX and LifeGuard together, we think we've got an extremely powerful combination there. Always consider Cabo. 
look at the lockdown mechanisms that are coming that are available in MX that are available in enterprise Android for app developers and I know there's a large segment that of you that are app developers look just looking at the CVEs go look at the CVEs and there are basic things that can be done to really harden your applications and, and for an application developer I would ask and suggest that when you see these support models think about offering to your customers extended support for your applications. So that if we've got an operating, we've got a device out there that's five, 10, five, eight, nine years, guess what? You can tell a customer, we are going to support you for that same. And I've already looked at Google Mobile Services, typically goes out for about five years, five plus years. Uh, we've talked to most of the EMMs, most of the EMMs are going six, seven years. So when you're talking about your application as a value add to your customer, certainly consider and say, hey, we are going to support you on that operating system for a longer period of time, which is going to allow you to keep these devices in service. That's going to lower your TCO. Um, now, simple things, you look how many, how many threats are, you know, simple stuff like an integer overflow or buffer overflow, right? Uh, it's just amazing and remote code execution from there. Okay, questions? Yes? Maybe, uh, no, there's no quite. Oh, there is crazy well, question, so I'm not going to say it. Mitigation and remediation. Uh, in fact, right now, uh, if we uh, go on MX interface, on mm -hmm. MX, and we have some some uh, patch security <coughs> patches that are available. They have patches that for for the OS, we can mm -hmm. take the latest OS with the patch and information. Okay, so a couple of things there on the patches. When the under lifeguard, those patches require you to be on the latest maintenance release. And this was, we spent a lot of time wrestling this back and forth because a lot of customers want to lock in on a specific code base and don't want a maintenance release. But on the other hand, we couldn't go and validate every security patch on every incremental maintenance release. So I'm not sure this addresses your question, but just recognize that when you do a security patch, it's validated for the latest maintenance release so if there was maintenance release one, two, and three, and we came out with a security patch after maintenance release three, customers gotta be on maintenance release three. We're not gonna validate it for two or one. So there is a little bit of a forcing function to tell the customer it's gotta be on that latest release. Because right now, if we want to uh, if we have a TC51 and we, we mm -hmm. apply a new, uh, a new uh, an update of the, of the OS and mm -hmm. we get all the patches, so we, through we don't have Zebra Live Graph now, right now. Well, we have this no, you, you will have it. Uh, any device that's under Zebra One Care, you'll get it now. This is already in, in, institutionalized. You know, the update rate, okay, you know, we're still three, five days, but we'll be better than that. But yeah, this is already for TC51. LifeGuard is already in, in place. So you, you'll be seeing actually the TC51, there's a new patch. The June patch, I think, is coming out, uh, I want to say this week, actually. So you should already see these patches. Any other questions? Yes? Can you elaborate on the um, M2M uh, aspect? Yeah. So you think about all the information that is available. So let's take a scenario. You're on an EMM, and you're sitting there. Well, right now, this is a somewhat manual process. I mean, it's really manual without the notifications. It's, I've got to go, go look at the Zebra website. I've got TC70s. OK, what's, oh, nothing. OK, I'll come back tomorrow. That's not the way it's short. Notifications are coming next week. Okay, now I get notified. Well, okay, it's still a manual process. I gotta go, I gotta download it, I gotta provision it, either sideload or using it over the air through the EMM. Um, the right way and the ultimate end state for this should be that the EMM, through a RESTful web service, should be able to, the EMM has visibility into all the devices in the portfolio. Should be able to take the device information, go query the Zebra portal and say, hey, I've got TC70s. Their TC70 model XYZ. Oh, we provide back through that machine to machine interface. Oh, by the way, here are all the patches available for that. And by the way, we'll identify the severity of all the different vulnerabilities because you might want to create a policy in the EMM that sits there and says, you know what? Don't tell me about anything that doesn't have a security uh, critical patch. Or don't even tell me during, if I'm a retailer, don't tell me about anything other than critical during my blackout, you know, my peak season. So we want to enable those types of, of policies. The, when we go beyond that and we start talking about security analytics, that's really about saying, 
looking at the profiles of those devices and saying, well, guess what? You're running, you may be uh, application whitelisted. Well, that vulnerability starts by loading a malicious application. You may already have your first layer of defense in depth in place, in which case, from a security analytics standpoint, we might actually tell you that, okay, it's a critical vulnerability. However, you've already got something in place that would give you some safeguard. Okay. Yes. Will there be some time that over the air updates will be available for zero devices without using MVM? Will there be a direct way to yes. do it? Yes, yes. There, that's coming in with the... Because with not the, everyone is using yeah. MVM or... Uh, absolutely. With, the, with that RESTful web service, there will be a way of doing it outside the EMM as well. And especially, like think, even in the staging process, but then you'll be another way of doing it so that if you don't have an EMM, you can get the updates as well. But you still have to have it under a service agreement. Okay. That's the one requirement. And that's different in a consumer world. Once again, here's where the sales guys will usually cringe. You know, the consumer devices, I'll say one thing that is, you get it for free. Here you have to be under service agreement. Okay. Yes? Uh, when you release a new patch, does it always include previous patches? Yes, yes, great question. I'm sorry I didn't mention it. These are always acu cumulative patches. We, we learned in the past, we had a lot of issues where, oh yeah, now you gotta go back and load patch one, two, three, four, so you can get five. Now this time, if you load five, you're gonna get one, two, three, four, that'll come with it. And there are ways, it's protected, to actually uh, back rev the patch. Okay. So if in fact, when you're going through that cycle, I've tested it in the lab, uh-oh, the application's working a little funky here, let me go back, you know, stuff happens, so you will be able to go back as well. Okay. Yes? No, it's, it, you know, it's truly just, it's a patch. It's, it, now, there will be cases. So the, the only other questions are, how big is a patch? A patch could be 20 to 40 megabyte, or it can be a full BSP at some point where, because they're cumulative, at some point these get bigger and bigger and bigger. And I'm told that this is, okay, one more question, yeah. Yeah, so uh, what's uh, security analytics? So the security analytics would be is the ability for us to actually look at how these devices are protected. Are the application whitelist? Is Bluetooth shut down? Is ADB shut down? And then take a look at the vulnerabilities and say, are you still vulnerable or are you not vulnerable? So to put some intelligence, because customers don't want to, they resist doing it, just like all of us. We don't want to press that key. Customers are the same way. You got 20, I was in a, Home Depot meeting and the CIO had to run out of the office because his POS system got updated and took around all of his North America POS from an update. So, you know, these guys are paranoid. Okay. Justin? We're on overtime. Yes? Do you guys always reset during the patch? We're always what? Reset and reboot. You, yes, you do have to reboot the device to, to have the patch installed. Yes, you do. Yeah. Not a cold, not a factory reset. It's just a, a warm boot. Right, exactly. Okay, thank you very much.